Welcome everyone. My name is Ramses Out. I am community manager at Luxeek. Today I am joined by Dario da Silva, and we are going to talk about workflow design specifically for Luxeek, but obviously uh, the steps that we'll um, talk through will also be applicable to other systems, other tools. And basically you could apply them to your whole tool stack. So your whole knowledge work or creative tool stack. Uh, today we'll be talking about our own personal knowledge management journeys. So Dario will share how he got into this whole PKM tools for thought space, as it's called. Uh, I will share a little bit and then hopefully through our story and the storytelling, you will discover um, hopefully some, some hook points where you can identify where you are in your journey. Because I've, I've noticed that many people, they go through several steps in this journey. So many people, they start out with uh, maybe a course and they very rigorous, uh, rigorously apply those principles to their knowledge graph only to discover, oh, my use case is different or it's nuanced or I'm working with these data formats or this is more my process or I use pen and paper uh, um, and I don't always have my mobile devices with me. Our own situations are so diverse that um, this way, I believe, this way of sharing knowledge um, is a very useful way to get inspiration for your own workflows. So that is what we want to talk about today. Um, Dario, can you please introduce yourself? Welcome, by the way. Uh, and thank you for uh, being here, for, for joining me today. Uh, thanks for inviting me, Ramses. Um, yeah, I think, you know, echoing what you said about people join, start using a system and then yeah, fall away. I think the only reason that I ever got like properly into LogSeq was because of lockdown, um, not having anything else to do really. I, we went into lockdown, I think it was December, 2021, when the UK went into, or 2020, when the UK went into like quite a long lockdown. And then I just really plugged away at it for a few months and like made the systems work for me. Um, I think I have always been incredibly scattered and have like notes across different mediums like i've got like literally a stack of journals that's actually over there that i actually want to integrate into into logseq eventually um different text files and microsoft word and google docs and always thinking oh what's the where's the best place to put this um never ever looking at the stuff that i've written down before but feeling that there's a lot of value in it and then when i found when i got to grips with logseq um, particularly on like the importing of, of other files into LogSeq. It was just suddenly like the, the lights went off, like all the dots were connected. Um, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not someone to like really look around for different tools and and, and keep trying. So I, I'm sort of hedged my bets and, and stuck it out with LogSeq and very, very stoked to have done so. Um, and yeah, I think there was a lot of tutorials on on Rome, which I and I still love looking at people's Rome tutorials because I think it's such cool workflows that, that you can learn from. And I just wish that I had had certain information up front and I sort of created the resources that I had wanted. And that's where I am today. So yeah, that's my PKM story. It's more of like a PKM over the years that finally caught up in like in an all in one platform. So pretty yeah. stoked. Yeah. Yeah, I could I could talk for hours about my journey and frustrations. Um, I started well, basically, I think like anyone, I started with note taking um, in college, but it was all on paper, never organized. I was always running through my papers. Then I started in uh, telemarketing, and we had basically a CRM, and I was writing a lot of notes because I was on the telephone all day, and I had to follow up with calls with prospects, and then until they would convert, and I could send basically. Uh, an account manager colleague like a salesperson to 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 the potential client so i was taking a lot of notes but still it was all it was just a dedicated system i didn't really have a need for creative work and uh i tried several tools and the more i got into i would say fuzzy roles so less defined professional roles i went from telemarketer to account manager, to customer success manager. And that was basically all very defined. Like we had, we had to basically templates, I would say for sales cycles, we had templates for how to onboard new, new clients. But then as I got further into my career, 
and Marvels became more and more technical and basically bespoke integrations or uh, uh, um, implementations of software. That is, was really where I had to work with many people, hear uh, things from different departments. And that is how I first got into Notion, which was very unwieldy um, to, to organize because I felt like I was spending more time organizing than actually using the system. Um, so I was, I really felt like it was always, instead of living in a house, it were, there were always like construction going on. I didn't really feel comfortable in, in my note system. And that was when I discovered, um, Rome in 2020. And it's funny that you say it because I think many people got into, to Rome, um, and other, like these nerdy tools that are not shipped with a very clear manual. Um, like maybe Notion or even Evernote, there's already a lot of content out there. For these tools, there's not really a path yet. And it, it requires, I think, a little bit of a different way of, of thinking. But when you are when you have nothing to do, you can dive into these systems. And I think it took me maybe more than 20 hours before I really felt like, oh, I can use Rome. Um, and that basically primed me to use Voxseek. But for people who do not come from an outliner type or maybe a, a wiki a wiki environment like tiddly wiki mm -hmm. which has many overlap with fun in functionality with what luxeek provides i think it's very can be very confusing for people to think oh like how do i actually get stuff done because writing on the journals page writing an outline that is you know it's it's easy it's like how you would use any outline even if you would write on 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 paper but then the question becomes okay you have all these different tools in this in this app um how do you actually use it like how like how do you use links properly how do you use queries like how do i find back my notes i think that is a yeah. like, question i hear and that really takes practice but hopefully today we can talk a little bit about hey how can you accelerate that process and think a little bit more in a structured way at least that is i think that what i have landed on for me it has become quite in intuitive if i want to resurface information or build a system I know basically because I know the the basic building blocks of Logseek and how they interact, I can build my own systems. But if you don't know that, that is, I think, very difficult to get started. What What, what is your view on it? Yeah, man, so many different views and different trains of thought to be, go down. I mean, I think being able to trust yourself and trust that the information is going to resurface is this huge hurdle when you start using it. And I think, I, I don't know if I, if I told you the story where I was getting inputs from um, from Readwise and like via my daily email and then putting them in one by one, like into each book separately, um, like the different highlights and building that up over time to like try and figure out this, like the whole way that Rome was working. Or oh, actually, was, was it Logseek or Rome? That, I can't even remember. But I mean, spending hours just like then trying to go and find the notes and being like, where did I put this? And like, I lost trust a number of times. And I think I didn't want to pay for courses. I was like, nah, this is like, I want to like see if I can figure this out because Rome was also, I think it was still Rome days because Rome was expensive. And I was like, oh, I don't know if I can justify this. Um, I see there's a lot of questions in, in, in the chat and how, maybe if you can moderate if, if necessary, but um, I will. the one, I will. the one that has popped up is mobile. And like, I, I don't actually use mobile at all. Like for my notes, I just like use a little bit of quick capture. And I think that was like, part of the reason why I was able to like dedicate more time to it because a lot of people that's one of their key requirements whereas like my key requirement wasn't mobile it was like sitting in front of my computer or pen and paper although I'm starting to use a lot more mobile now so I'm, I'm excited that the apps are, are getting up to speed but yeah it's really a thing of, of trusting your system and and also knowing how the different parts work together I mean now I look back and I'm like geez I, I can't imagine life without it like you know but I, and I think that idea that something can be in more than one place just by creating a, a, a link or a tag. Um, that's incredibly powerful. But when you, when you don't really know that the power of that, anything can only ever be in one place and you have to remember where that thing is. And I, I feel like it's almost like a trivial thing of, um, you know, hierarchy versus being able to get into that network approach and go and find the different things. But when that became accessible to me, it was, I, I didn't have to, have my file storage sorted out because I mean my desktop and my my computer is quite a mess. Like when I work in an organization, like it's, it's easy to to sort of 
do things in a very structured manner because you have your different departments or whatever, and you're thinking through as a team, it has to be very structured. But when I do it myself, it just tends to go into my downloads folder. And then like, I never do anything with it. But now like everything goes into LogSeq and it's like all tagged. And I'm trying to build a system of tags with some of Carl Voigt's, um, I don't know if you've seen his, what do you call them, little scripts that you can download from his website. I mean, he's an information management specialist and I really just like reading through his stuff because he, he thinks through things so clearly. Um, but this whole idea of like something being in more than one place is very, very powerful. And I think that's like that idea that tags really unlocked for me. Yeah, for me, basically block references were what initially um, sucked me into this this way of working. So first it was it was Rome, um, but I was I was getting into philosophy and to learn more about philosophy. I was blogging about it, so I was basically forcing myself to learn about different concepts, especially like Eastern philosophy and and ancient Greek philosophy and the the overlap. So I had to do a lot of compare and contrast, and then I noticed that as I was searching through my Evernote, I kept encountering the same snippets of text that I had reused over and over again. So for example, one quote could be in, in 10 different places, but then I would just, because I had copy pasted it, but then I had the context in mind and I had basically an entry point. So the quote being the entry point, but I wanted to, to read the context. So I had to basically go through five different notes to see where I would find the context. Whereas then I discovered Rome and I saw block references and I was like, whoa. So I could reuse this one quote and it will, will become an entry point to everywhere where I've used it. And that, that blew my mind because I was like, I don't need to, I don't need to click from note to notes because I have everything in one view. So either the sidebar or just the link references and scanning those is way quicker than opening a page one by one. And that, that for me, that was the, the first thing that sucked me in. So the, basically the bi-directional links, it's not spectacular probably for people who are more into coding and, and the, the idea of transclusion is decades old. But for me, that was like, blew my mind. Literally I was like, whoa, this well, is lay, lay people like us who don't know how to code on <laughs> you, but yeah. um, it's amazing. Yeah. And then as I, as I started to use it, I always notice in myself that I would, and I think this is, this, many people have this experience, you know basically snippets of something, like keywords, and you search, you search for it, and then um, that is your entry point into something. And like Evernote has pretty good search, if you ask me, but then the, the, the downside is that you have to go note by note. Mm -hmm. So I think also the way information is organized in a system. So like in Loxy, but also Rome by extension, and I think Obsidian in some way where you can have a lot of information when you want it in one overview. So you have maybe a page where you have an embed, maybe with linked references that you have open and another page open in uh, the sidebar. So basically you can have four pieces of information in a very compact window and you can rearrange it as you want. And I think for me, that was very useful because as I was reading stuff, maybe about Buddhism and then uh, things about Stoicism, I had the notes open and then on the page, I could just write about it. So I didn't have to go back and forth. And with my terrible ADHD, my, like basically my attention span of a goldfish, I could never keep enough in my mind, but, but just, I could just only had to move my eyes because everything was in, in one, in one area. And then people would argue, yeah, but I could do the same thing with Evernote. I will just open several pages. Yeah, but organizing those pages already causes friction. Like the friction is my is my mantra, like reduce friction. Uh, <laughs> I just had a massive easier. smile like when you started telling that story because I and maybe this is like a segue into the workflows a little bit, because yeah. I remember like getting a bit more into block references at the end. I don't, even, I don't even know when it was. Maybe at the end of last year when I was like doing a bit of research for that, like the YouTube course, whatever. Because I don't really use, I hadn't used block references that much. And I was just doing a bit more research and looking around. And then I saw your workflow on someone else's video. Like, I, I don't know who it was, but 
you're basically going through your writing workflow and how you do everything from a page and use block references. And I thought, wow, that's actually brilliant. Like I've never done block references like that. Um, and now I've started to use it a lot more. And, I, and, I, and like the power of block references has really become you know, apparent in the sense that you can create those exact same links, for that, but for maybe more bulky text that you don't want to put into like a page link or you know, it's a different level of hierarchy. You don't want it to be, you know, create a million pages in your database. Um, so it was actually watching a video that you had done with someone else on Rome at the time. So it was like long ago, um, really helped me like grasp that idea of block references. So now I use them. <laughs> Thanks to you. That is, that is really great to hear. Um, and I have actually created a, uh, article also about it. Um, maybe you need to register for the newsletter. I'm not sure, but it's, it's really accessible and I will share my screen quickly to run through basically my basic workflow. So basically I have four steps and this is based on, on Rome research, but this, the same applies. Um, so, and, and this is a workflow for content creation and specifically creating a newsletter. So what I did for my, uh, newsletter for a long time, I have a li little bit of a different process, but this is how it started out. And I can show you later how it, how it developed, but it's, it was basically, uh, or it is a basically a, a curated newsletter where I link to resources. So, um, in this case, the, I would just tag basically an article with metadata. This is Rome in, in Logseq. I would use block properties for this or page properties. Um, I would just tag it with the, um, the edition, the newsletter edition, where I wanted to use this. If you're writing an article, you could you could uh, link to the article here, and then this can be a very slow, like simmering process. So as you encounter links, as you or uh, articles or videos, um, and you take notes on them, you just tag the page, and then you start to curate sources. So what I would do is I would start an outline with a bunch of links I wanted to check out and make it a to-do. And then nest nested underneath, I would basically retrieve the block references of the quotes that I would want to use in um, my article or newsletter. So basically this is an outline. This is part of an outline and I just show where I got it from, what page. And then I would, the next step, I would basically add commentary. So it's a curated newsletter, I use quotes or use quotes or highlights as a uh, inspiration. And then I basically just write, um, the, the article in, in this case it was, was like, uh, Rome, but I use the same process in Logseek. So this is using block references. And then later I will, it's just, just synthesizing. So throwing all those different branches of blocks together into, uh, an article. So with, with uh, Logseek, it's super easy because I can just do export as. And then um, nowadays I use Ghost, so I can just copy paste the markdown into uh, uh, into Ghost. So very very easy, and it's this is basically uh, based on the code framework. Uh, the the one from from uh, building Tiago. second brain, yeah, yeah. So um, I can very quickly run through it. So this is, and I have a I have a whole session about this, I will share the link in a little bit, um, where I ran through this for Rome research. So, uh, but the, the, the process is, it's basically the same. It's a blog based outliner. So, um, yeah. so the, the code framework, it's, let's see, it's, um, basically a, a collection of steps and these are basically sub processes. So you have, uh, a collect phase. You have an organized phase, you have a distill phase, and you have an express phase. So express is basically synth synthesis. So collect, like I've just shown in that article, I would just add a, um, a link to an internal link, like just a hashtag to the article that I wanted to reference in the curated newsletter. Organize is when I go and actually create an outline for that newsletter and uh, sum up all the articles that I've linked to that I want to curate in a newsletter and then retrieve basically the, the, uh, um, 
the, the, the block reference is the distill phase. So I first organize them. I first know, okay, these are the articles I want to check out in my graph. And then the distill phase is I'm going to actually retrieve individual block references from there. And express is another process because I have basically a bunch of steps that I go through to take something out of Logseq into Go. So there are several process, uh, there, there, it's basically a sub process or a sub workflow, uh, just a series of steps. And so that is what I use for most of my content. It's a very like simmer, it's basically simmer. It's a, it's a very slow process. It's like a slow cooker. I don't think on Friday I need to send a newsletter. Now I'm going to look for resources. I used to do that with my philosophy newsletter. It was a very bad idea because I would spend my entire Sunday on reading stuff and thinking, oh, this is not good. This is not good. That is not good. Oh, maybe I should write an article myself. Like, it, just a shit show. <laughs> so with this process, and obviously this is for content uh, creation, but I used basically the same approach for um, proposals in my job. So uh, my my previous job for basically a, a, a big company for I, I was working for a company that had like 20,000 employees. So anything we did had to go through a very rigorous approval process. So I was uh, co responsible for our recruitment infrastructure. So if we would want to do a change on the website, I don't know, like change navigation, or change a color, I would need to have basically sources to support that change. I would have to maybe quote uh, research or I would have to quote blog articles or whatever. So the process would be the same, but instead of uh, using, oh, uh, Sunday school number 13 as this is where I want to use it, I would have um, proposal uh, like uh, iteration 2.3 of the recruitment website. And then at some point I would, the deadline would come up and I would actually have to turn in the proposal. I would go into my graph, retrieve all the linked references and use the same code framework to express my, my proposal, my views on what we should change. Um, so this code framework sure. you, can, you can use in, in many ways if you have to digest ideas, I would say, and share them, share your view with other people. And Tiago calls it uh, that we live in the perspective era so now knowledge workers are basically paid to form an opinion, uh, uh, hopefully a well-founded opinion, and then um, give advice on what to do. So consume information and, and spread new information or insights. So that so is what coaching work really helps with. It makes you wonder though, if they should like rather reduce the bureaucracy required to make a change on the website so that people can actually like carry on doing the work. <laughs> uh, that, that, is, that was futile. That was true. Though. Like uh, I, th I think that one iteration took us a year because it had to go through five committees. <laughs> it's just crazy. It's, it's very uh, crazy. I think I'm going to share my screen um, because I think there's an, a very similar example, and and I, I chatted a little bit to to Cara actually about this. I see Cara's on the call um, on like a research workflow, um, which is which is quite similar if I think about it. Like using block references and and an approach to um, yeah to to build up this like these fragments of information that you can then use a little bit later. Um, and yeah, but before, before I go there, I think there was a, a good question that came through on Twitter, which was about, um, you know, building workflows or designing the workflows doesn't really work because inevitably it will change. And I think that's like, there's very good, good points there. Like things will change, but it's always, or it can be quite useful to have a point of departure and then allow things to iterate. And, if, I, if I'm honest and reflect back on my whole process, it's been more a case of documentation rather than design. Like I design the processes by continually like smashing my head against the wall, figuring it out and then like, okay, cool, this has worked. And this is now how I, how I get there, like repeatedly and reliably. Um, and I think it can just be a good starting point for others, but it's not to say that like, this is a perfect thing. And it's like, oh, I'm going to make all these things work together and it's going to look amazing. But I'm going to bring up the, the little drawing that I've prepped here for, um, for a research workflow. Let me just share my screen. Dun, dun, dun. Um, so I think a lot of people are familiar with um, Joel, Chan's, Joel Chan's work. 
Um, he uses Roam Research for research. So he's got a system for putting all his papers into Roam and, and then filtering up the insights into different zettles that he then uses for different synthesis notes. I'm not going to go into too much detail on this. It's actually like prep work that I'm doing for a video. So hopefully not too long into the future, but um, he's got this little work, work workflow. So he starts from his sources or well, he actually starts with questions, but that's a whole other thing. And then he gets context from that, from those context snippets. So you can think of this as like the author's information. He makes observations. And then from those different om observations, he collates them together to synthesize an answer to a question. Now, I one of the things like from a visual workflow perspective that I really like to do is build left to right rather than um, you know, this bottom up, top down approach, whatever. I think like our brains, you know, just from a, from, from a process management perspective, our brains tend to work left to right if you're from a left to right country. I mean, if you're from right to left, Arabic or Hebrew, whatever, maybe then build your workflows right to left. But yeah, so I think- It's a metro flow, basically. It, it feels yeah. like, okay, this, like, this is actually something that processes or, or progresses, I should say. Yeah, and I don't have my own database open um, with, but there's a there's some really good resources on um, on process mapping from Alex Sharp. I'll, I'll I'll see if I can quickly send the link because I was going to go into another database, my demo database, and and show some things. But um, yeah, he talks a lot about like process mapping using Lucid Chart. So this is um, Excalidraw at the moment. So you know, nice sketch noting, but there's like so many different tools that you can do this on, and um, Lucid Chart is just one of them. Um, but yeah, thinking back or, or thinking about this example, like what it really starts with for, for, um, for Joel and for researchers in general, I guess, is like framing the problem. So developing a set of questions that you want to answer and um, using that as your points of departure when you are reading any information. So when you get to the text, it's not like you're just like making random notes that are not like related. And this, this is, Speaking purely theoretically, you can also do that. And then those can magically filter up later on. But like from a process perspective, it's good to, to have like an output in mind. Um, and then developing a hypothesis and then going and doing a literature review. Um, so this is obviously iterative as well. So whilst you're doing uh, your, your hypothesis building or your reading, whatever, all of these things might change. So I'm not a researcher, I don't pretend to know all these things, but I was like, the example that I'm looking at going back is my thesis and trying to figure out like how I might have done the, like all of these things a little bit better. So if we just look at Joel's colors over here, it starts with the questions. So if I just move that down there, and then what happens is he will then have observations, which then get built into synthesis. So that's mapping those colors up there. Um, but yeah, then the process that I'm like really thinking about from a, from a log seek perspective is using page references and block references and also your PDF highlighter in order to like bring everything together like at a later stage. So if I, um, yeah, let's, let's go maybe into log seek and I can show that. Dun, dun, dun. And here's my research topic. Okay, cool. So this is the example. I've just taken my own thesis from 11 years ago. And well, however long I did my thesis, I can't even remember. Let me make this a bit bigger. And then basically built it or broken it down into questions. And, and there's still a lot of work to go on this. And, and yeah, but it's just for me helpful to think about like structuring these different things. And let me see. I'm going to jump into this question here just as an example of how I might go. So I, I have a bunch of papers that then I start reading in order to answer this question. And then I might bring up the paper on the right side of the screen. And you can see that on, make that there so that I can hide this. So on the, um, and I can open up the PDF actually, or I have this, PDF here. So now I've got three pages. Sorry, it's getting a bit messy. But now I'm, I'm trying to answer the question, is there sufficient seismic loading in this region in order to cause liquefaction? So what I'm doing is I'm reading through this paper. I have the question in my mind. Say now I find this information here. 
and I decide that is pertinent, I can then copy the text. So that's the context snippet that Joel speaks about. And then let me just, and I, and then I, under my literature notes section on that page, so it's important to also think about indentation. Um, I then have this question over there, and then I can paste the context snippets, which will show up there in the highlights. So I'm just, there's a zoom bar over here, which is um, impeding my view, but then I can actually synthesize that or like make an observation on that. So let me say, it seems like there should be enough. It seems like it's whatever. That's my observation. And then I can, you know, for all intents and purposes, also indent this so that it, I can collapse these different views here. So these are all the observations on this page or on this question on this actual literature page. So now when I want to go and answer this question, I can you know, have maybe a synthesis page that answers, um, that groups all of the different observations into like one synthesized answer. So let me just say, this is a synthesis page and then yes, there is enough um, seismic loading, seismic loading. So then, that would be the synthesis page. And then I can open this up. And then by filtering out, I, actually, let me just uh, let me open this up on the left, on the, on the right sidebar, close this page over here. I can then open up my literature notes on the left side of the page and then filter by the question that I'm actually trying to answer. So then I just say, okay, that's the question I'm trying to answer. And then I can see there. I can, it's bringing up all the different blocks that I want to like in order to bring the synthesized answer out. So then I can start writing my beautiful synthesized answer, beautiful synthesized answer. And I can, if necessary, use block references and then indent those underneath there, just so that I've got this like full track record of all the things that I've done in my database and bringing out the different pieces that are pertinent to answering that question. Um, so that if we go back to um, this piece over here, I have my sources. I'm getting the context snippets above that. I'm then writing small observations on top of that. And then I'm aggregating them into synthesis notes. And all of this is done by using just different features of log seek, so block references and page references. Um, and I, maybe a, a better place to have started would actually have been this like workflow overview side of things. Cause like when I, when I think about um, log seek or, or note take, it's all about information management. So, you know, every piece of information that you, you're managing is entered as some entity in your database. It's either a page and like a journal is a type of page. So it's, not too special. It's a block in a page or it's a asset or a drawing or something like that. So you know, it's, it's always one of those different things. And what really is the power of the application, like the all-in-one thinking application is the fact that you can create the links that you need. And those links are you know, the relationships in a sense. And that's what you're talking about. You know, programmers have known this for years, but like when it comes, when, when it gets abstracted to a level, for a common man to use, it really becomes quite powerful. So it's all about defining these relationships. Um, and then, so the ways that we can define page uh, or relationships, page linking, block referencing, using properties, which is basically a, another type of relationship, I guess, more structure, indenting and namespaces. And that's giving us a little bit of hierarchy, which is again, just different types of relationships. So all of these things are just like relating all the different pieces as you go. So, you know, I, I think getting onto, well, let me just jump this part because this part's all like retrieval. I, 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 I want to I jump in here briefly because. Yeah, go for it. I'll be talking too much. Um, a few things. Because my question that always would pop, uh, pops up in my mind is okay, but how do we get here? Because you mentioned a few building blocks, a few principles of LogSeq, like. Uh, page links, block references, properties, indentation, namespaces. If you are new to LogSeq, you don't know all these things. So my question is always, 
what, what is basically the starting point. So I can show a little bit of my workflow to define workflows in a bit, which is not as visual as you have it. Which I really like this. And I, when you first showed me, I thought I should probably do something like this because this is what I used to do as a job, like create diagrams like this, draw uh, integrations, and then I don't do it for my for myself, which is pretty silly. But anyway, my, my question is more like, do you first, or when you started with Luxie, because you, you didn't use Rome first, right? You came to Luxie directly, I think. Maybe you explored I, a little I bit. I used Rome for like uh, three months, and then I Okay, I okay. Through. So the, the question is basically how like how did you discover what's possible with the with the tool and then how did you go to designing your workflows in a visual way was it first a lot of trial and error and then at some point you formalized it or was it more i would say almost like a notion user would have to do sit down think through what is what like what is it that you need what is the wanted outcome and then build that using the different building blocks so what what was your process like in when you just started yeah, my, it's so interesting that you, you say that because it's exactly what the, you're saying about the documentation versus like banging your head against the wall because it is, it's literally 95% banging our head against the wall and then like these moments of like, wow, this actually works. And it, it's something I noted when you were talking about code um, that, that uh, the last point there being express and having some form of output becomes a really powerful for forcing mechanism for you to find out where things are going wrong and why things aren't working. So the more I write using my database, the more things become like refined and I can see like why things are, are not working or where they might need to change. So I think having some sort of for putting an artificial for forcing mechanism for yourself is quite useful so that you are making sure that your, your database is effectively set up from the beginning because you know you don't know what you don't know and if you're just doing things like blindly it can be you know you can build in a lot of technical debt essentially into your database like from a very early perspective whereas if you're using it to you know put together a newsletter or put together um whatever video script or anything like that and, and resurfacing things like that's when the pedal hits the metal and you have to be able to resurface the information so i think that's like a really important maybe um tip it's just like have some sort of output that you're working towards like if, if it's a i think for me professionally the first output was in meetings i was like i need to know what i said or what was agreed upon and yeah i worked in a very chaotic environment so it wasn't like we had to go through the same sort of bureaucracy that you went through but when you knew that information you better have it in place to to have a defense um for for your rationale so i think in a professional setting meetings can be quite a good forcing mechanism actually and also being able to like for me it really just started as like a, a a crm of sorts like inbox speak to this person okay bring that information out there like it there was the knowledge management was so um far from my from my reach like i only started using that like as I said, when I went into lockdown, when I then was like, I'm going to put everything that I know in here before it was just meetings and like a personal and, and a professional workflow. Yeah. Did you want to show something next? Otherwise I can maybe jump quickly into basically my workflow to design my workflows and then showcase one workflow that was the end result of it. Basically a standard operating procedure that I can now outsource. Um, if I, I think you should. I think you should 100% show your workflow because I've been talking a bit too much. But on, on, while Maybe you that's find me, that, so no worries. Oh, good. I, I'm happy. I'm happy for that. For once, I don't. I don't have to rent for one hour straight. <laughs> while whilst you find that, though, I think like you asked the question, like what are the, like you know as a beginner, what are the two most important things? And I, I went and I highlighted those two things for me, which is like page links and indenting. Like everything mm -hmm. else can come later. Like, don't yeah. worry about namespaces. Don't worry about hierarchy or, um, or block exactly. references. Because block references are cool, but like, I, mean, I only started using them recently. But those yeah. two things, oh. If, if you want to find stuff back, page links as an entry point, basically. So because of the bi-directional links, linked references, like 
the page links at, uh, act as a as an entry point, and then the indentation is to group together um, related blocks of information. Um, talking of block references, Matt is asking using block references. A lot of Luxic specific code is also present. I, I guess when you uh, export it, Matt. Yeah. Okay. I see you not. So, are there any plans or strategies to only get the text? Uh, yeah, there are plans to improve that. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, there is a uh, there's a export to PDF uh, plugin now by the uh, Aryan. Obviously, it's to to PDF. I think he's also thinking of export to Word, which turns the block references into actual text. Um, it's from our side, totally honest. I feel it's a little bit of an oversight for now, uh, but we have so many things that we we need to focus on, and only ten person team, so uh, it's it's uh, sometimes a struggle. But good feedback, and definitely on on our roadmap. Um, oh yeah, and I think uh, Ariane is also working on a export to uh, to Yugo, so Yugo Site Builder uh, plugin. So that is for me. I will be very happy because also it will also be easier to deploy the. The documentation and it will be a way for professionals i think to basically share their knowledge could be within a, a team uh, but you can then just link to your static site that is fed by your log graph and then just say oh my notes are here uh, obviously no collaboration yet that will be later but for now that will be a, a solution let me just jump into my workflow to define workflows and so I did this session before, um, and I will put the link in the chat. I did a live session about this, and it was centered around Rome. I will link to the recording in a bit. But basically, I walk through <laughs> answering very simple question, what is a workflow? Because I, I don't, sometimes I know ah, it's not always clear. Basically, a workflow is just a list of tasks and pre-made decisions, so you already know what to do. You don't have to think as you're performing the action, what is the next action? And it's also a way to store knowledge, like the way I approach it. It's a way to store the knowledge about a process outside of your brain. So you don't need to keep all the steps in mind. In a bit, we'll look at my video editing process. So after this session, I will edit this uh, this recording. I will sh we'll look at the process, how I... Uh, what what it what it looks like, but it's many steps too much to keep in my mind. And basically, the ingredients are uh, wanted outcome. I think Nikki said it said it uh, in the chat. Always start with the uh, end in mind. So the wanted outcome, the process steps, refinement, very important. And once you have it refined, you use templates. So um, I like to start from basically a role perspective. Maybe it's my my stoic uh, philosophy interest because in stoicism, basically the idea is you play many different roles in your life. So what are the roles and how would you like to act in those roles as basically a way to excellence? And this workflow, to define workflow workflows, is a way to strive for excellence. <laughs> Very philosophical, but that's, that's how I look at it. Um, so what is your role? What is your wanted outcome? So pick one task, and task is often... Uh, you can break it up in diff different steps. So you can think of one task, but then you have to dig deeper into what is it that you want to do. So example we'll look at is publish a video. I would often put in my to-do list, publish a, a recording of live session. <laughs> so it's stupid because it's like a 30 step task. So, uh, but anyway, so what does it look like once you have turned this task or process into a fixed workflow? So that is what you should start thinking about. Um, in my case, video editing, I wish it were faster, easier, more predictable. Then what are the steps involved? So think of all the little action actions that you normally do manually to achieve the wanted outcome. And with manually, I mean, like as you're doing it, what is the next step that you would do? So for example, in my case, I would think, okay, I want to publish this video. What is just the first step I need to take to make that a reality? So it's a, it's a lot like uh, David Allen's um, getting things done. So what is the next physical action? So I would think I need to publish this recording. What is the first step? First, I need to retrieve the video files from, um, from Zoom. Okay, I have the video files now. What is the next step? Next step would be 
I need to edit them. Okay, where do I need to edit the recording? Open ScreenFlow. That is my favorite uh, video editor, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the whole process, and I, I would like to give this as homework to pick one task and then go through it. So clearly define the outcome you seek. Clearly define all the steps in the process. Obviously, we have a refinement step, so don't overthink it. And focus, I would say, on the first next action, the first physical action. So refine by looking for any missing or superfluous steps, order the steps in sequence, ask for every step, can I turn this into a standard template? Build a template for each step and combine the templates as much as possible into one. So now let's just go and I will go into light mode. Let's just fire off a template. So I have a bunch of template templates and I have an SOP defined for zoom edit. And you will see, I will have um, three processes, like three workflows that are made up of individual steps. So I have the prepare phase, I have the edit phase, and I have the publish phase. So normally how I try to approach this is I can do this in three work sessions. So if you think about intermediate packets, um, so if I just have maybe 15 minutes, I know I can do the prepare step. The added step, I know, okay, this can take up to two hours. So I need to carefully plan this. And then publish can take up to another hour, depending on how much I need to do. But basically, I just run through this. And when I started out, I would just write down every time I sat down to edit the video, I would just write down a few of the steps that I would have to take. And then um, basically just nest them underneath the to do, like, um, a published video, and then I would just nest under underneath the, the sub to do's basically. And over time, I came to okay, this is what I need to do every time. So at first, it was just download video files. Um, and then, like, uh, like the, the first step was I had written down like download video files or get video files. I didn't even have rename video files, I didn't even have convert video files. Convert is necessary because, uh, you know, ScreenFlow things. <laughs> so these are steps I need to take, but it's very precise. Um, I can give this SOP, the standard operating procedure now to someone, um, but still, if I would give it to someone, for example, when I say, oh, uh, add keyframes for transitions, maybe I would need to define when would be a transition. So like when someone shares their screen, that is when I need to add a transition. So the, the camera feed moves to, to the corner and becomes round um, instead of you know disappearing altogether. Um, add markers for timestamps. Maybe if I outsource this, I would need to add some instructions um, how to add timestamps. But for me, this is enough now. So I have some stuff still in my, in my mind because I know how to use ScreenFlow. But depending on how proficient you are with something, you can basically outsource everything to your Luxeek template, uh, because anything that you don't know or you tend to forget, you just put it in the template and then it's there. But this is like, this came into existence through the workflow that I just showed. So it, it went through many iterations, many refinements, but this is what I use to just run through stuff that I need to do repeatedly. And there are too many steps to really keep into consideration because for example, Many times it would happen that I wouldn't convert the video files to MOV, then I would export out of ScreenFlow based on the MP4 files and everything would be out of sync. So I could basically start over. Very, very expensive lessons. Um, add markers for timestamps. That it was after I had forgotten to add or note down the timestamps as I was editing. So I had to rewatch the whole recording to add the timestamps. Uh, check keyframes to check effect came, became part of the workflow after I noticed, oh, I've added a, a, a keyframe here and then something went wrong because I didn't check it. And then like basically the second half of the recording was out of whack. So uh, many, many things uh, come through experience, but then I write them down immediately instead of thinking, oh, I will think of this later. No, I go to my templates page and add this after I felt the sting, like the moment I feel the sting of uh, like running aground in a process, like fuck, 
should have thought of this. Like I always forget this. Okay, immediately go to the templates page uh, and change change the the template so it doesn't happen again. That is basically my my uh, approach to uh, to operational excellence. I would say <laughs> to avoid pain. <laughs> to avoid pain exactly. Yeah, so that's that a... my my five minute rant about uh, why it's so important to refine your workflows and write them down. Write them I must down. Like commend you on your diligence yeah cheaper this is um yeah <laughs> i think i i still probably do it at like a, high, a much higher level of abstraction rather than like the like getting into the nitty-gritty i do think someone asked about um a while back about how this might look in the um in a, in a corporate setting or in a, in a team setting and i think the having processes that are you know accessed from a template that are essentially a checklist that someone will then have to tick through and that becomes like a really good like task management. I mean, there's a guy who wrote a book called The Checklist Manifesto, which is probably not worth reading, but it's just interesting from a um, the perspective of doing things repeatedly well, like how, how powerful it can be. Um, I, I think uh, we're probably heading to, to five o'clock. I'm, I'm keen and available to stay on a little bit longer, but uh, if you want to wrap it up for, for some people and then we can just carry on looking at yeah. workflows or whatever. <laughs> I mean, I could rent on for this again for, for hours. So I think we should go into q and I'm going to scroll through the chat. Uh, but if you have a question for either of us, just put the word question and then your question. Uh, Druf is uh, asking, can you share if you use Luxseek to collaborate with others for a shared project? Let me uh, share some best practices. So what we use is GitHub to sync. So that I can share like how I basically use GitHub desktop. Basically, anytime I make a change, I push it uh, to GitHub through GitHub desktop. So in this case, I've only updated ramses.md. So I can just click commit to commit to master and push origin. So it's basically two steps. And that way, uh, we can collaborate, we are working on real-time collaboration um, after we release the sync. I can maybe show a little bit. Well, whilst that's opening up the yeah. deep linking question, so will there be deep links in LogSeq so that we can add these workflows as project pages to our task managers? So basically the question is, will you be able to link from another app to a specific block or a page in, in LogSeq? Uh, Yes, that will uh, that will be that will be in the app. I don't know when, uh, but we're we're working on it. But this is basically uh -huh. how I work in our Grasso. The best practice in Loxy, but I would say also in in other tools like Obsidian. People have asked me, "Hey, how would I collaborate in in Obsidian?" Basically, I recommend the same approach. So we work from our personal page. So I plan my week every every. Uh, every week and then every day I have the the individual dates where I um, I just plan I just plan the tasks that I need to do and then when someone is wondering hey what is Rams was working on well they can just go to the page go to my page and then see oh what I've worked on um, I will add you know my notes just underneath here so it's one big outline um, so I don't, I don't create different pages. I dump everything on this page. Obviously I have some pages like community, like the community, uh, oh, the community. Uh, I have no idea why it's not loading. Yeah. So for example, I have community feedback. So this is a namespace. I do organize a little bit, but then again, I just dump everything on here. So, uh, when I see feedback in the community, I just take a screenshot, copy paste it in here. It's very, very frictionless, but I, I don't bother too much with different pages. This is just, I have the community, uh, namespace in, in Loxic and our collaborative graph. And then uh, slash feedback. I have community slash workflow Wednesdays where I prepare the sessions. So, that is basically how we use it in a collaborative graph. Uh, the key being work from your own page. And then we also have basically owners for um, namespaces. So I, I own the community namespace. So I primarily write here. That helps with GitHub sync issues. Like it would 
throw everything on the journals page, it has happened that people at the same time created the new block and then there was some kind of merge issue. So we're working on a sync service to, to solve that, but that, that will take um, a few more months before it's uh, generally available. Exactly. There's one here, which is, I think is a cool one, which is what, what are your favorite uses for properties and ways of interacting with properties? Ah, I think that I is like... a pretty cool use case. I have a very cool use case, but you can share first okay. if you want. No, you go. And then, well, I don't know. I've also, like, I love properties. Like properties are one of my favorite things. Um, like when entering metadata, like I think that was like the one thing which from a Rome perspective, like you had to enter like every line and then, you know, your metadata is basically a separate line, but having it all in one block and being able to attach that to, you know, a single block and then indenting underneath there and just putting all the information, that's an absolute winner. Um, I think also page properties allowing you to do, you know, what you can do with data view on Obsidian, but like natively built into LogSeq, like using the page view properties. So say so now you have a page and you've defined a property status, and then you can say status to do, not, not using LogSeq's built-in task management properties now, but then, you know, query up and like bring all those, your pages that have to do into a table. Like it's quite powerful. Um, I could, if you show yours and I'll, I'll get into my database. Yeah. So my main use case is, um, my main use case is actually daily habit tracking. So you see this, uh, oh, I should share my screen. Yeah. So you see this empty block on the top, but when I click into it, you will see a few properties here. Yeah, that's clever. So. So what do I do with it? Well, it would go to yesterday. I had my input. So I am learning Italian and I have different categories of input. So listening input, which I call media input. So watching television, audio or listening to audiobooks, play games in Italian. I had I, the, the minutes I spent with my space repetition system, which I regard as input because I'm, I'm tracking the amount of input. I have a very weird language learning approach. So I, basically force myself to not speak the first 700 hours I'm getting input in a language. It's super extreme, I know. But by this, I, I know, okay, how am I on track? And my goal is, okay, this year during Christmas, I will be able to be basically start talking and really build my conversational fluency. But by, because of all the input, I will know how to sign, sound. That is basically my, my process. It's how I learned Spanish. So I know, I know it works for me. But then what I could do is there is this plugin by, uh, by Aryan and let me see, it's called property visualiz uh, visualizer. So what you can do is you can input a property. Um, so in this case, let's say, uh, Italian media minutes, I want to see a, just a table, just going to do a table. I'll just leave this as it is. Um, wait, let's see. I, maybe I made a mistake here. Uh, did I make a mistake to our table? Oh, okay. I should have this. Oh, 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 oh. The finickiness is my computer. Like really doesn't, really doesn't like it so let's see i think i can just remove this and just say table and then i'll say the last i don't know 30 days so it should be able to visualize this now yeah it takes a while especially as my computer is super slow hmm i see the the filter isn't working so if Aryan is watching this hopefully he will see but basically the script will run through all the dates all the metadata and then when it's done running, hopefully not in an hour, but <laughs> once it's done running, I will have basically my median input time, my uh, average input time, uh, a total input time. So uh, that is basically for me a way to see if I'm on track with the, if I do the chart, I can see, oh, what weeks was I slacking off? And that can help me also gain insight in Am I putting too much on my plate? Like what was, what was on my plate? Otherwise, 
uh, that that month or or period? Um, I just like using the table view, and then if I sorry TRTL and I make this wide mode, like then I can go through and you know I've I've queried using property type article, and every single piece in my database, like content that comes in, uh, let's use this one for instance, has got the same metadata, which is like who's the producer, what's the type where's the source and what's the tags. And I really like this as a forcing mechanism as well. So when I am reading anything, it really makes me think about like where I want to put this for future use and like how I want to, to use it um, at a later stage. So this tags one is a really good forcing mechanism, like, because you can't just, you know, put like some keyword, you have to think, uh, where, if I want to search for this again, like where, where do I want it to come up? Um, so yeah, I really like when this came out, that was, geez, I don't know, <laughs> happy days for, for me, Logsy, because I, I use properties everywhere, um, for, for these inputs. Um, and it's funny because the, the, the example that you shared on the, um, I, I actually had built something here, which could be used as a, as an example, but like, if you do, if you're learning guitar chords, for instance, you can go and build the properties on your daily journal page. So if I, you know, exactly what you did though. So yeah, exact same example from a habit tracking perspective. So you use also the table view to do operations on it or just to visualize basically properties? No, just, just to have like a, a table, just like it's basically like consolidated database um, or consolidated view of the database. Um, mm -hmm. I don't use operations yet. I, I haven't seen myself like, you know, wanting to get into like a, a use case. It's more <sighs> analytics is always this weird question. Like, why are you doing analytics? Like, is it, uh, is there an output in mind? That's, but it's just getting very meta. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, personally, I like, I like to track stuff because it makes finding them easier. Um, so metadata is very, very useful. Well, in, in the sense of Fluxy, you can use metadata to give an alias to a page yeah, um, or diff several aliases. Um, it's icons. Very... Sorry. Icons. Yeah, as well. So those are more the hidden features. I would say overall, the metadata fe or the, the, the blog properties feature is very useful to just give information about the page, but then there's also block ref, uh, block properties. So you can basically give a property to a block. So give in extra information and then using some CSS, you can hide it from the block. So you can basically add a lot of information to a block, create your own data structure almost because it's just key value pairs and create your own data structure in Logseq and then add that Again, you can just have it as a template and then add that to two blocks. There is uh, a question by Sid about basically if you're a beginner and you have, don't have a clear end, end goal in mind yet, what would you do next apart from um, page linking and indentation? My advice is if you have, if you need to produce some kind of output, uh, um, the next step I would recommend is looking into queries. For many people, it's very advanced. They think, oh, queries are very advanced, but I believe that it will help you understand the structure of Luxseq better. So as you create branches mm -hmm. of blocks with links at different levels, you'll see in the queries how they basically interact those links. So for example, you can have a link in the first block of a branch and then a link at the last block of the branch. And then in a query, like writing a query, you will be able to better understand, oh, this is how it works. So I, I believe that queries are a very good learning tool in themselves. Plus, they are a really good way to build a workflow. So you, like I have my content workflow in Luxseq. Maybe I can share very quickly. So let's see, these are recent. No, so I go to area slash think stack, which is my blog. I have my content pipeline. I, these are just links, but uh, the simplest workflow is basically 
uh, newsletter resources. So this is a change from the, the workflow I've shown before. Now, I don't really curate articles anymore. It's more videos, it's more plugins, it's maybe little scripts. So the workflow that I had before that really leaned on block references wasn't really working anymore because I wasn't really distilling content from the content I had consumed. So now I'm more linking to stuff. So that is how I use it. I have a very simple query set up. Uh, so it's a resource, uh, area slash things that club. It has to be a to do and it does, should not be a template because why well, shouldn't it be a template? Because otherwise the template itself will uh, appear. So I have a template set up and then what does it contain? The template just contains these. This is insane. Okay. Just a quick. <laughs> Are you using text This is my computer. Well as... This is not Logsync. <laughs> this is my computer. But basically, I have this this metadata, and then it will appear in the in the query. So that is how. This is a very simple process, uh, just to collect stuff. Then I have a content pipeline, so I have ideas. Again, I have a I have a a, a template set up to capture ideas, which is very similar. It's a to do. It's a hashtag content, hashtag idea, and then for things like club. So for here, um, then, and I have many ideas, I have stuff in the research phase. How do I retrieve that? Well, it's, hash, it's uh, hashtag content and hashtag research. So when I then go to the outline phase, I just change re hashtag research for hashtag outline and it jumps to the next phase. So I can basically go from, okay, now I have an hour time, I want to work on an outline. I can just jump into outline and I can see, oh, what is it that um, I'm outlining? And she can see stuff can be in this phase for very long. <laughs> so, but this way, basically my ideas don't fall through the cracks and then stuff I've been working on don't fall through the cracks. So yeah. that is how I would recommend to use um, queries to build a process um, so again, it's this workflow uh, design that you work that you go through. What is your wanted outcome? Your well, your wanted outcome is a is a published piece. What are the steps? Like the intermediate steps are well, you have an idea, then you research it, then you outline it, then you draft it, and then maybe I should have a, an editing phase. But my editing tends to be very haphazard, so. Uh, I, I don't have a face for it. So that, that is how I approach it. So just to add on that, I think like thinking about things in terms of a, a process, like this is the one that I didn't commit to talk about other software, but like where Notion is really good and you can customize your, um, your workflows quite nicely by using your different columns and having like a drop, like a drop down or like a single select option, like an air table. Um, and I think that's where logs you can get to in the future if you use properties because properties is essentially creating a column for your for your block it's saying you know like like i had the the with the transformation of the the article query it had article producer etc now if you think of a situation where you have like status and that status becomes a drop down like then you can um you know manage workflows like linearly through that process um so yeah, so, it's a future applications. So, but you, you mentioned dropdown. So you would like to have a dropdown basically in your template for properties. Well, uh, hmm. that would be cool by the way. Pro pro probably not like as a, I think this is the, the difficulty where it's like, you know, maybe for certain states, like you can mm -hmm. say, like give people like the ability to choose a state and instead of being to do doing done, I've got like eight oh, states on that, a project that, management that cycle. thing. Yeah, there's a feature request for that. Um, I'm not sure yeah. in in like in what in what way um, the product team has been looking at it, um, but it's but also it's from a customization set. perspective. If you if you're yeah. able to like um, customize your properties and then be able to like select them with a drop down, oh, that'd be amazing. Because um, yeah, we can have another session on that. Or, like. Workflows. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But Kara has a question or comment, so I'm going to ask her to uh, mute herself. Thanks. Um, I'm just wondering so I know that there's an, a CSV uh, import 
uh, plugin. I'm wondering if there's any plan for a CSV export plugin because I'm hearing you talk about tables and how you're basically creating a big old data set. Um, and I'm wondering if uh, that could be something that you could export from your from your graph after that. So that's what I wanted to, uh, you know, put on everyone's mind is how uh, you can use, um, sorry, how you can use uh, LogSec as a uh, tool for data curation. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think a plugin would be very, very doable um, for for yeah. that. Um, like we have, we have yeah. no plans for a native uh, CSV export, but I think it could be quite easy to to uh, to create. But it's 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 a great it's a great comment and it's a great idea because, like you say, you using basically indentation, um, and the, if you look at the the way tables work, it's Basically, yeah, you're building a big, big ass data set. <laughs> Sharing something just like to get the the creative juices flowing for people, like from a workflow perspective. Um, when I used to work um, in industry, where's the share screen right down there? Um, like, I really got got to become very fond of, of Miro and Mural, like both of them. We actually didn't chat about it, but like, I mean, Lucid Chart, Miro whimsical mural they can all do very similar things but like and it's funny that you mentioned like you did a you were part of a recruitment process because i was also part of a recruitment process but we had this flow chart which like we built i built to like um show the flow of an applicant's information and um yeah how they go through our um our different funnels and how we can cycle them through and do the correct tests or whatever and i think it's useful for any yeah, anyone to have this sort of thing, for, especially for like a complex process, like just have like all these stage gates and like a decision framework. So um, using the, the traditional flowchart model, like where a, a, a diamond is a decision, like yes or no, um, depending on what uh, what you're using, this trapezium is like an input. Um, you can use different things like this. This one over here indicates some sort of script or, or function. Um, again, like it's all around developing a, a visual language for yourself. And that, that was one of the things, um, again, there were so many different tangents we could have gone down, but maybe going back to, to Mural um, and this workflow overview, it's like having, if, you, if you're wanting to make it visual, having a visual language to help yourself understand your own diagrams. Because like I come back to things and I'm like, oh my word, like what is happening here? Like, what is this thing? And like, um, oh, I flipped it, it was actually... <laughs> Another thing, which is like a whole bunch of bird names on a page and then like zebra and then the same thing, but in pictures. Like, so it's like all the birds in pictures and then a zebra. And it's like, which one is not a bird? And it's obviously very easy. You can go to the, um, <laughs> the zebra because you know, your brains are like very visual. So yeah, having this, um, these colorations also help me tremendously just to like, Think about the different things and like how they all interact. So I'm not using the colors down here, but like, yeah, building visual workflows just really helps. So having a, having a look at other tools and 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 um, yeah, how they might work for you. Because Excalidraw is cool, but not for everyone. Like I, Miro from a company perspective is really really good. Um, Mural as well, whimsical. Yeah, it's it's. You're you're so right about that because when sure. when I was designing integrations and was working with with uh, non technical um, stakeholders, I could write out an integration, and that's what how I would get started. I would write out like jot down an integration as basically a mind map, which is an outline, and then, but only when I use in my case Lucid charts then people would be like, ah, okay, so this is how it works. Then suddenly it was clear, like in, in, in like one view, you had it so within one minute you could walk th someone through it and, and people don't have to visualize how, how things go. Um, a, a question I got repeatedly from the same person. <laughs> Cedric, can you rephrase the collaborative workflow? Um, so main principles are work from your own page so you have a page with your own name and that's where you do everything. Normally, if you use a graph just by yourself, you would use the journals page way more. The way I do it is I put a date link 
on, on like somewhere on my personal page. And then everything that I do on that day is nested underneath. So it will still show up on the journals page. So the rest of the team can see what I worked on that day, but it, it prevents merge conflicts when I send things to GitHub. As for the namespaces, basically I am the only community person within Logseek. So in our collaborative graph, we have a page called community and then anything related to community and now that I need to create a page for, I just name it community slash, and then maybe feedback or sessions or bugs, whatever, like things that I capture from the community. I am building a community hub. So oh, you're getting a sneak preview. It's basically a knowledge base, I would say. Um, and I, uh, so I'm, I have a few categories like welcome, feature demos, courses, and your free courses here, uh, Dario, as well. Hey. So to give you, to give you an, an idea, I want to collect resources created by the community. And um, it's quite intense, this project, because I watch the content and then I try to uh, summarize uh, parts of it. So if you go to, for example, workflows. Um, so this one is a little bit more uh, extensive. Basically what I do is I watch the content and then I take screenshots, which I think show some, some structure in Logseek that could be useful as inspiration. So you can quickly go through this. So my question to everyone who is here, if you know of good content and I should share the link, please fill in this form because I have about 50 resources collected now. Uh, not all edit yet, but um, yeah, I need, I need more resources, especially written resources. I want to host uh, templates in here. I want to host query scripts in here. So anything that is useful, please either tag me on Discord, tag me on Twitter, send it to me through the form, like whatever you, you, you think uh, will be useful or you like will be a way you can reach me, just send it to me. I am looking for everything. If you create content yourself, I want to promote it. So don't, don't uh, feel uh, bad that you are sharing your own content. I invite you, like everyone, if you could create content, if you create a video every week, send me a link every week. I wanted to edit. Like this, I want to make this the most complete resource available for Logseek uh, community content. We, we like as a community manager of Logseek, this is one of my biggest projects that I'm working on this quarter, um, and and also the the next one. Uh, when will this be available? I hope to launch first version next week or the week after. So on Thursday. I have a meeting with my manager at Logseek, so um, uh, An, so An does products for us, and he's the co-founder of Logseek. So uh, yeah, I, I I want to show this to him. So I'm very busy adding new resources, and then as a minimum viable product, we'll launch it, and then hopefully they will create some buzz, and soon we'll have hundreds of of resources. Um, for now, this is just knowledge base. In time, we'll replace this with uh, with Logseek Publish, but we need to do some some work on Logseek Publish to make it nicer looking. But basically, this will be more or less what it will look like um, for for the foreseeable future. All right, so that's a sneak peek. But yeah, you you will be able to find everything here from daily workflows to learning workflows to academic workflows. All the workflow Wednesday recordings will be in a community hub. All the office hours will be in the community hub. Um, and in fact, there will be a office hours next week. So be sure to, well, actually you get the, the, the link to the office hours if you signed up for this session. So you'll get it. Will there be a recording of the session? <laughs> there will be a recording of the session, yeah. <laughs> Where will I find it? <laughs> <laughs> you get it in your email. So you get it oh, in your email. You. All right. No one asked. It's amazing. Uh, maybe they read, read my tweet, <laughs> my frustration. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, okay. Thanks, uh, yeah, thank you. This this was fun. Like, this is a little bit different. Normally, 
like the last two times it was just uh Aryan and then Kara sharing their workflow and me shutting up. Um often it's me renting a lot and now we were renting both. So you'll see how much time <laughs> it, it takes. But hopefully the recording will be much shorter because I'm going to cut out a lot. So give yourself a lot of work cutting out stuff. No, I love I love banter on <laughs> chatting yeah. about different things. I think it'd be interesting to have like a um yeah, I mean you can see I'm going again. The um yeah, like a product session maybe. Like if um yeah, getting like everyone not everyone, like just like a group of people to like chat to the developers and, and just see how they use it. I d I don't know. But that that's happening on Discord. I'm gonna stop talking now. <laughs> Wait, can you can you repeat that? You said like having a a product almost like a user um user ga- user research session with like people mm-hmm. who like are like incredibly participative because there's a few people in the chat that you can see like know, know their yeah. stuff. Um yeah, so there there are a few ways we we want to basically um ask the the, the help from the community. So now we have an an actual great product designer and uh I would say a UX expert Jakob. Yeah. And he it's is good. he he asks people um in Discord also for feedback. Um, we have these sessions, so the chat is very useful feedback mechanism for us. Obviously, I am in the Discord, also in the feedback channel, um, on Twitter, uh, we're very active, the features um, overview. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it, it, I, I like these sessions because we get to see how people work. Another thing I would like to do is basically, you know, you have the study with me sessions I would like to record and also add it to the to the community hub basically like work with me so someone just doing knowledge work um I, I you know I call it game film for knowledge work so Andy Matushek uh used to do it I think Norm from Rome FM does it so he has a YouTube channel uh, Norm uh, Norm Cella and, and Joel does it does, as well yeah Joel so I think those are very good starting points. Obviously, I want to see how people use Luxeek. So I'm waiting for those videos, um, but maybe I'll do one myself. I'll ask people to do it. So um, yeah, anything cool. from, think... uh, from you, uh, Dario? No, thanks to everyone who stayed. I mean, it's cool that we still got a, quite a handful of participants. Thanks for facilitating the session. It was also, yeah, I learned a little bit, a lot, not a little bit, like it's just, it's nice to see how you do things like incredibly systematically. I think I've never been that systematic for myself. I'm always systematic when working for organizations, but when I'm working for myself, I'm just like, ah, it's okay. This will happen. It sort of comes and comes and goes. It's like, it's, yeah, it's inspiring to see someone who's like so diligent for like everything. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's, it, it has been a, uh, it's been a, a long journey, <laughs> a lot of frustrations. <laughs> and obviously I still run and I still bang my head, like I run into problems, I bang my head against the wall when things, like I lose things. I really saved this, but then I didn't tag it or whatever. It's, uh, it can be very frustrating. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a process. Like that, that is my biggest tip. Just know it's, it's, you know, you, you, things will change. Like you will not know everything that needs to be part of a process. Now, unless you have been mm-hmm. doing something for years and you really know how to do something. But then the question is, do you really need to think through a process like this? Do you need yeah. to create a diagram? I still believe you should, because as you write things down, you refine them. But yeah, these sessions uh, are, are very useful to see how people use them. And like I said in the introduction, it's impossible to follow someone else's process to the letter. So through these sessions, hopefully you can can get some inspiration and then apply that to your own graph, yeah. your own workflows. Um, but yeah. Yeah, man. Cool. Thanks so much. Have a good evening. Thank um, you. We'll chat and soon. That, we'll chat soon. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers, everyone.